I'm honorable to invite Dr. Scott Edmonds for his keynote today. Uh, Dr. Edmonds trained as a biochemistry at Imperial College and obtained his PhD on molecular pathology of ocular mel melanoma at the Royal London Hospital. Dr. Edmonds taught data management and curation at Hong Kong University. Now, Dr. Edmonds is editor-in-chief of GICA Science Press, is vice chair of the board of directors of the Dryad uh, Digital Repository and co-founder uh, of uh, CV site formerly Open Data, uh, Open Data Hong Kong. Dr. Edmonds, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself and start sharing your slides. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to um, talk about my favorite subject, uh, uh, Open Data, um, and to, to, uh, to uh, 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 an, an interesting audience um, to myself. Um, so uh, normally I'm based uh, at the Giga Science office in um, Shekmun in 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 Sha Tin in 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 Hong Kong, and um, our other office, our other main office is in Shenzhen. So Greater Air, Bay Area is normally my um, my home. I'm doing this talk from a hotel room in in Singapore at the moment because I'm uh, away traveling. But um, yeah, I will hopefully be back in. in in a few months. And um, so I was asked to talk about um, uh, open data and particularly the FAIR principles. So I will um, try to uh, cover a lot of that in, in, in the background um, because I was one of the authors on the original FAIR principles um, um, paper. So hopefully can give a bit of insight. And then um, because of the, the, the topic, um, we've actually been doing quite a lot of work with infectious disease data and um, disease vector data in, in particular. So then I will do my best to give a lot of kind of practical examples um, of, uh, of, of, of handling this data. Um, so um, to, to, to start with, you know, you can ask the, the, the question, you know, what's the importance of open data? And, and it, it, it's not really a hard sell at the moment, right? In the middle of a, or hopefully towards the end of a disease pandemic, we everybody should understand, you know, how important um, data has been in 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 this battle, and 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 not just infectious diseases, but in in, in so many areas, you know, climate change, uh, cancer research, um, data data saves lives. It, it's the it's the you, you know you can't fight things that you that you don't understand. Um, scientists researchers were at the front line of this and and our and our key key tool to do so much of this is is data um and um we need to share it quickly we need to fill fill data gaps um so uh this is a, a paper i particularly like um uh, in nature communications a few years ago looking at, at, at biodiversity data and a biodiversity is, is, a, is a proxy for so many of these things, you know, it helps you understand uh, changes in climate, um, um, you know, many, many, many areas. And the, it, this shows two, two maps, you know, the, the, the top one, um, if, so uh, species richness, right? The, the, the amount of biodiversity, um, you can see this red band. Uh, red is 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 rich, right? This this red band goes through the kind of the middle of the world, the, the and and kind of just touching here on the on the Greater Bay Area as well. You know, this is the these are the kind of the biodiversity hotspots. But when you look at the the completeness of of biodiversity data, right? How this has been captured by the by the research community, blue and grey is is little and, and and no data. The the, the most biodiverse places actually have the proportionally the least least complete data right that le least complete records and um you know this is important from from species loss and habitat change and the like but but also infectious disease um if you map you know malaria vectors on on top of all of this um the places where you know with the with the most of these um disease vectors also overlap with the you know the the, the least complete um, biodiversity records. So you can really see the challenge in in um, in 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 uh, you know a, the need to address and, and fill these data gaps. You know this is why uh, open data. This is one of the many many reasons open data is so important. 
And the de facto home for, for so much of this information is, is GBIF. Um, there are many, many data repositories, many, many places to put, put data. And uh, GBIF, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, is a, is, is a kind of network of, 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 of many, many of, of these sources um, capturing all of the uh, occurrences, all of these ob observations, and you know, literally billions of them from around the world uh, and counting. And, and this, amongst many, many other um, data repositories, I, I'm on the board, for example, of, of, of Dryad, which is, which is uh, one that um, publishes a lot of uh, biodiversity um, research as well. Um, so yes, th uh, it's, it's important to um, uh, fill this to, to, to tackle issues, um, to, to, to tackle these global global uh, challenges, but also to um, to build trust. To um, so much of these problems, we you know need to be dealt with uh, politically. You need you need the public on side, and a, and a lack of data can lead to um, as we've seen in in uh, as we've seen in the coronavirus pandemic, uh, conspiracy theories. Um, we, you know where there are information gaps, um, all kinds of uh, crazy ideas can kind of can kind of run riot. And and it's been called by many the 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 current pandemic and an infodemic. And um, so much of this is is because of a lack of trust and a lack of data. And so um, this is this is our challenge uh, as 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 researchers. And and to date, we've in a, a, a lot of these areas we've not done a very good job. Um, the uh, looking at another disease epidemic um, uh, when Ebola happened about eight years ago. Um, we we you know we all understand the importance of genomic surveillance in in this current current pandemic. It's it's really become uh, one of the key tools. But back in 2014, you know, sequencing data was 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 really needed to understand the the this outbreak. But uh, if you look at um, when the you know the, the the rise in the number of cases mapped to the rise in the release of of sequencing data, the really shocking thing to see is. When the when the disease outbreak becomes more important, the amount of data actually stops being shared, and this is because a, a lot of this is because of messed up incentive system. Once it becomes a hot topic, um, people can get you know uh, high profile publications, and so they stop sharing the data and start writing up these papers, and and this really does not help the world. This really does not help public health. This really does not help trust as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to come back to these uh, incentive systems later, but um, you know this is a, this is a really a bad, bad example, but they're, they're really good examples. Like hopefully we 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 may have learned um, a, a bit from this. And uh, one of my heroes of the the last couple of years is Zhang Yongzhen, um, who was the first person to share share the uh, sequencing data from. Um, from the coronavirus pandemic, from, from SARS-CoV-2 data, back at the very beginning of, of January 2012, and the sequence that he shared is the sequence that's been injected into uh, all of our arms, and you know, in, in mRNA vaccines, in uh, all of the the uh, diagnostic, you know, PCR-based diagnostic tests. All of this was dependent on him sharing immediately, sharing the data as soon as it had come off the sequencer. Um, he started uploading it on the second of second of January, and um, just have so much credit and kudos for for, for, for doing this. Um, we and others have given him prizes and and recognition for this. Time uh, listed him as one of the most influential people of 2020. And um, Nick Lohman at the University of Birmingham, when we presented him with an award, um, said. Every single day of delay can be measured in lives during a pandemic. And so Zhang Yongzhen's early and principled data sharing was a transformative first step in the scientific fight against COVID-19. So this is a great, you know, but they, these are the things that need to be, need to be rewarded. Um, th this is, a, this is um, so important to the scientific process. But yeah, as, as I said, the, the unfortunately incentive systems have not really been aligned to this. The main vector, the main way that we um, communicate scientific information since 1860, since 1665, for, for over 350 years, has been the scientific publication. 
And this pro process, unfortunately, has changed very little in this time. Um, even in the 90s, um, Bockert and Donahoe um, had this great comment that scholarly articles are merely advertisements of scholarship. The actual scholarly artifacts, the data and computational methods which support this remain largely inaccessible, right? And particularly, you know, we're in so much more data-driven age. This is the stuff that, this is the bread and butter that feeds research now. This is the stuff that we need, but everything has been really focused on, on, on the narrative and descriptions of this. And so it, we really, really need to, need to push ways of, of the, you know, the research data and software and the underlying methods, they need to be shared for scrutiny and reuse. And we should credit and track them and treat them in the same way that we treat narrative publications. These, if, if we truly believe that they're first class research objects, we should treat them in, in, in this way. And on top of being open, um, it, 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 it's all well and good. You know, that's the first step. You can stick a load of stuff in a Dropbox link, link but it also needs to be fair. And what I mean by fair is um well the, the, you know there's the there's the english word fair and um the opposite of of, of fair is 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 unfair it, it, it is cheating um and uh a, a, you know a fair question to ask for when we when we publish um scientific research and you know a, a, we've seen how important individual papers can be in during the coronavirus pandemic for example, this paper in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents by Didier Raoult that was highlighted by Donald Trump on Twitter, you know, as, a, as potentially a game changer, um, pushing uh, hydroxychloroquine as a, as a treatment for, for, um, for COVID. You, we, we should really ask questions that, you know, a paper like this, uh, if we want to trust it, is all of the raw data publicly available? Um, can you access the, the process data and results supporting all of this, supporting any figures and tables and, and graphs? Were all, are all of the reagents available? Um, are the protocols, the ethics forms, the trial registration information available? Um, and was this all available for scrutiny by the peer reviewers before the actual publication? And, and unfortunately, for most uh, most journals, this is a complete black box. You know, we, you to really trust something, you should really be able to inspect the the peer reviews, inspect all of this stuff. The readers should be able to as well to really trust it. And then, um, it, it would the would the same journal that published this research would it be a venue to publish and 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 update this with you know if people have done positive or negative replication studies you know in the same venue to share it. This this would be more fair. Uh, ways to assess research um, and and you know data data is really crucial to this but how you present data it, it, it is extremely complicated there are many many uh, uh, ways uh, uh, um, uh, models standards gap guidelines for the for the contextual information that's needed for the information needed for reuse um, uh, ways of doing this, data models, uh, guidelines, recommendations. It's, it's extremely complicated, you know, to take data beyond just a, a dump of something in a, in, in a Dropbox folder to um, something really usable and understandable. And so this is where the FAIR principles uh, came into being. So this paper was published, um, the FAIR Guiding Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship. It was published in uh, 2016. Um, uh, I was, yeah, probably the only um, uh, author listed in, in Asia, um, but it, it really uh, looks at this issue and just tries to kind of simplify and, and put this all in, in context in a really easy way. And to do this fair is, it, at one level, it, it's, it's just a simple mnemonic. It's, it's a way to remember what is, what is crucial here. Um, and that open data is more than just disclosure. Um, it, it, we need to think about the users, humans, and uh, and machines, um, and uh, and 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 the, you know, fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
And there are these, um, it, the paper then goes into a lot more detail on what the key things are to make, to, to, to make things um, F-A-I-R. Um, persistent identifiers, the things you should do with the metadata, the licensing, all of these things are, are, are crucial. The interoperability is possibly the more, most complicated part and really looks at the issue of, of making this data usable by machines. Um, but, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a mnemonic. It's also um, uh, rules and, and, and ways to make things machine readable. Humans play a big part of this as well. And um, we and others uh, have organized a BYODs, Bring Your Own Data workshops um, that, that help with this verification process. You bring the, the domain experts with, and the data experts together um, and, 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 and help make things fair. It, it also has um, producing an ecosystem of, of tools and workflows and repositories um, verifying, um, you know, tools to verify data and then um, publish it and, and store it in, in Fairport repositories. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a number of schemes that have done this. So from a, from a, 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 a paper uh, and, a, and a kind of a method of, of about five years ago, it's really kind of um, spread around the world. The uh, Hangzhou Summit, G20 Summit, um in 2016 even uh in in the in the communique even listed that uh you know um and and promoted uh fair, the fair principles which was really exciting to see so beyond um so beyond fair and it's kind of up taken in many many parts of the world um so many of these things have, have really gone mainstream now. And in uh, November of this year, UNESCO ratified it, the UNESCO re recommendations on open science, um, really pushing all member states of the scientists to actually start working open science uh, practices into into policy, into the 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 in, in, into the policies and practices of of their researchers and. Uh, through uh, China is a, is a signatory to this. Uh, Hong Kong and and you know um, all of the surrounding um, jurisdictions. We, we are we we are now um, uh, under under this uh, under these um, under these recommendations, but they go beyond just just open scientific knowledge. They go beyond just um, just open data, bare data to um look at the look at the bigger picture and, and and promote many other things so we we need to um um take steps you know the first step is 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 open then you move fair and you then you need to like think about all of these all of these general recommendations um to to, to really open up science and so that's where uh, my journal uh, giga science kind of uh, steps into the steps into the scene um so we 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 launched as a way to kind of help incentivize this um, open data and, and, and open science in, ge in general um, through, through publishing data and through publishing uh, software. So we launched, um, it's, our, it's our 10th birthday this summer, um, initially with Biomed Central and then with Oxford U University Press. And we, um, we weren't the first data journal, but we were the first in biomedical sciences and a number of other publishers have kind of uh, jumped on this bandwagon as a way of really crediting um, and, and giving the, you know, incentivizing the, the release of data, changing these incentive systems that I talked about. What we've done a bit differently from, um, from other journals is that we actually have our own data repository. We have a team of, of, of data curators on hand and on top of these um, subject specific and, 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 and other repositories out there such as GBIF and, and Dryad, if the data hasn't been shared somewhere, our team can um, step in and, and basically hold, hold, hold the hands of the researcher, help them to share it. And we give all of our data sets digital object identifiers with a uh, bit by being members of data site. So um, there's um, yeah, been a growing interest and, and in this area of, of, of data papers, of, of data publication. And this, this model, it really helps boost uh, fairness um, through you know, going beyond just a, a, a dump of data in a local file to 
crediting, adding more more metadata, um, going to you know uh, depositing the data in a third party online repository, and then uh, you know in the most kind of reusable way. On top of these kind of um, the machine readability side, creating a human uh, a narrative um, instructions on reusability that that essentially is is what this kind of data paper is all about. This you know we we package the data up in this way to increase the fairness. And um, uh, my slide's a bit slow. Second. Um, so it's and the key way to do this is it, it, it's quite simple you just have a data availability um, section in your paper that collects together the accession numbers and cites the key thing is you need to cite the doi um in in the in the references if you really believe um as a first class object of research you need to you need to um uh, treat it that way but yeah then you just collect together reporting checklists and and a bit of information on on reuse and 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 that's it right this is how essentially how a data paper works and you know while you know this is uh, kind of grown over the last decade it's it's actually nothing new it's 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 almost taking a step back to how things were done um at the time of darwin when you know um it, it, his work he he traveled around the world um collecting data and metadata uh cataloging this information and then when he got back to the uk he uh, deposited all of his data and specimens to the british museum and uh, and then wrote a, wrote his first data description article the the um, voyage of the beagle um uh, basically you know explaining all of this and 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 giving um you know, almost kind of reuse instructions he then spent uh, 20 years analyzing this very carefully you know coming up with um a hypothesis and um and then he published this uh, in 1859 as the origin of the species and this was the this was the analysis paper really so data publishing it, it is kind of going back to this and decoupling the, the 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 you know the data data collection part and the and the and the analysis and hypothesis part so um to give um to give a few examples um of of the kind of benefits of this and and how how it can um, have uh, benefits with uh, in uh, infectious disease research. Our very, very first um, data set that we published in our GigaDB repository related uh, was back in uh, tw 2011. And I don't know how many of you remember the um, horrific E. coli outbreak in Germany that killed over 50 people um, that summer. And um, it led to mass panic. Uh, people were... Um, blaming uh, Spanish agricultural products. There were like hundreds of millions of euros of cucumbers wasted and, and the like, but pe people were frantic to try and understand where this came from. And um, uh, se researchers uh, sequenced, the, sequenced the genome of this very, very quickly. And um, uh, talking to us, they allowed us to share it immediately um, in our new data repository and do a couple of experiments as well so they let us release it under a under a public domain waiver um, allowing anybody in the world to use it um uh, however however they wished but we also um we just started working with data site made this a first example where we gave the data set a digital object identifier a, a way that people if they use the data they could they could cite it in in the way that they would normally cite a paper so um, this was this was very, 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 very new a decade ago, and we didn't really know what would happen, but um, we shared it this way. I actually tweeted the data set on Twitter and then I went to bed. And then when I woke up the next morning, this whole global crowdsourcing effort had just uh, come, come out of nowhere, essentially. Um, uh, Nick Lohman, uh, who was then a PhD student, uh, assembled uh, our raw data and then um, uh, uh, shared the sequence of that on uh, via, via Twitter and on his blog. Then uh, researchers in Spain um, immediately annotated his data and did, did the same thing. And basically within within hours, there was this whole movement to, to, to share all of the data teams all around the world. We're doing this, trying to understand the source, the 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 this, you know the severity, all the things about this pathogen, 
Um, the Spanish researchers made a, a, a GitHub repository for everybody to, to share all of this, share all of their efforts. And um, yeah, very, very quickly, um, loads of things were, were discovered about this at a much, much faster rate than, than usual. Um, so uh, about a month later, the traditional narrative publication was, was published, um, but it specifically highlighted the open source analysis of, of this whole, whole um, process, which was, which was really, really exciting. So the, you know, we shared the data openly, but at the same time, the authors got the traditional form of credit as well. You know, they helped save the world and get a New England Journal of Medicine paper. And um, it, this has been used as an example over the, 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 the you know, the next decade. Um, you know, obviously the, the, pe the paper and data have done really well, but it was, you know, used immediately to create therapeutics, diagnostic tests, antimicrobials. The data has been used for platform com comparisons. But the thing I'm most proud about is it's been used as an example for faster and more open ways of doing science. Other companies such as PacBio shared their data under open licenses as well when they saw all that we did, because it allowed them to, to publish immediately without wasting time on, on uh, you know, getting the lawyers involved. And the Royal Society in the UK in 2012 published this very influential report, the um, Science is an Open Enterprise, and it actually highlighted our E. coli genome on the cover of this report, talking about it as an example of the power of intelligently open data. So going beyond just um, open, you know, uh, researchers sharing open data, the open science recommendations also talk about the need for open engagement of societal actors um, using tools such as crowdfunding, which I've uh, crowd sourcing, which I've already um, uh, given an example with, to or even getting uh, citizens and 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 the public involved in more participatory science. This is the key thing to really build trust. And this is something that we've been doing as well at, at GigaScience. We, uh, back in 2015, 2016, we um, did a, a real outreach project, Bohemia Genome, um, trying to just explain um, that DNA is not something to be scared of, um, really um, uh, going to schools, doing public talks, um, going on you know, RTHK, CNN um, talking about this open pro project to um, study the genome of, of, of Hong Kong's em emblematic flower and, and get the public involved in this whole process. And, and, and this, this is you know, really, really important to, 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 to build trust, build understanding. Um, beyond, us, beyond us, there's a, a bunch of people in, in, in Hong Kong that have set up their own biohacking labs, um, uh, efforts to to, to catalog this biodiversity in, in Hong Kong through um, DNA barcoding, um, you know, uh, groups on Facebook and the like looking at, you know, at, at jellyfish and various things of the, the biodiversity across Hong Kong. And after our Bohemia pro project, I've been involved in setting up uh, CitizenScience.Asia, which is a, a, a non-profit uh, registered in Hong Kong, to try to help promote and, and share information on, on, on all of these um, projects in, in, in Hong Kong and, and, and across Asia. So citizen science, as, as it, it's, um, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but it's actually nothing new. Um, in, in Hong Kong, for example, the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society have been collecting data, um, publishing their, their birding reports since, since the 1950s, since, since 1958. And while these, you know, um, interesting you know, citizens would, would collect this stuff in kind of uh, paper reports, over the years, the, these efforts have, have digit, digitized into kind of digital bird atlases to the, you know, where we are now, where all of these things work on your, on your, um, on your phones, on your on your mobile devices. Um, I naturalist, I'm a big fan of this. is um, a particularly good one um, from National Geographic for um, cataloging biodiversity information. Um, you just take pictures on your app, use your you know geolocated and like. And um, uh, in uh, Hong Kong's actually really good at this. Uh, City Nature Challenge is uh, at the end of this month. Um, it, it's a kind of global competition to capture biodiversity in Hong Kong uh, in most years has been second or third in the number of species captured, which is amazing. And if you go back to GPIF 
and look at where the sources of um, uh, where of of observations is are coming from now. The citizens are far out pacing the the you know the traditional academic researchers on these observations. Of the over a million observations now in Jiba from 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 Hong Kong. Um, almost 95% of them are from citizen scientists, are from um, uh, eBird, the eBird and iNaturalist apps. And, and this is this is the research grade apps where, where it has um, AI and human validation. It needs two humans to, to validate before it becomes research grade. And even with that, 95% of the of the data to fill these gaps in the, you know, in this biodiverse part of the world are from the citizens now. And so, um, you know, it's it's all well and good that they're capturing this biodiversity information, but can they actually uh, intervene and help in um, in uh, from a public health perspective? And um, the second example I'm going to uh, give you was um, is on is on is on um, uh, mosquito vectors. And um, back in uh, back in 2016. Um, there was a lot of um, mass panic about the the Zika pand the Zika epidemic um, in Latin America and potentially spreading to to Southeast Asia, and um, a lot of this was a a lot of the the, the panic and 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 fear was because of a, a lack of data. Um, you know, it's very difficult to get much of this data to come out of. South America, because of biosecurity laws, because of these research incentive systems I may have talked about before. So there's a, there's a data gap here, and a group of us um, organized a, a hackathon in in Hong Kong to try and um, look at the look at uh, how we can maybe fill some of these data gaps. Um, and, and look at the risks in, in in Hong Kong. And so we looked at the government, um, the, the data that was provided by the by the Hong Kong government, and they have this system of of setting uh, uh, gravid traps uh, now gravid traps across Hong Kong. Um, it was about fifty locations there. It's gone up to about sixty four locations, um, but. Um, this still means that uh, about 98, 97% of Hong Kong is not covered by these by these traps, right? The, 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 the data is, is, is not collected for the vast majority of Hong Kong. The data is not presented in the, in the um, uh, government repository, data.gov.hk. And if you can find the government website of this, the data is, is really not fair. It's really not usable. It's static PDFs maps and graphs all all in pdf format it's very very unusable there's no information on licensing anything like this so we really felt it was not fit for purpose and trying to think of ways that we could fill the gaps and we can see this in, in dengue outbreaks in hong kong as well the the um uh 2016 outbreak in in, in mid levels was actually outside of the the um of the of the data collection area and um FEHD, uh, when we, you know, uh, when they were contacted to ask about, you know, sharing more data, they actually stated the more information, the more unnecessary misunderstandings. Um, and so, uh, our citizens, we, we decided to, um, as citizens, to 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 get involved, and um, we we found an app called uh, Mosquito Alert. Uh, this came out of Spain, and basically, you use your mobile phones to just kind of um, take pictures of mosquitoes, take pictures of mosquito breeding sites. Um, and they have entomologists who then validate this and let you know, is it, are, are they uh, ADIS, a, you know, Asian tiger mosquitoes that carry, potentially would carry uh, um, uh, Zika, for example. Um, we translated the, because it was open source, we translated the app into uh, traditional Chinese, and we did a bit of outreach going to uh, schools and helping them set up projects where they sent the school kids out to take pictures of mosquitoes in their, in their, in their general vicinity. And it was really cool to see this, and uh, eventually they ingested the first round of this data into, into GBIF, and if you look at Hong Kong, the little dots here were basically the data sets collected by our 11, 12 year old students. So it was amazing to see that, that Hong Kong children were, were um, potentially producing more uh, research grade and sharing more research grade data than the, uh, than the, than the professionals here. So um, 
the other uh, other big area that the uh, open science recommendations talk about is um, infrastructures, the need for uh, infrastructures to really um, help this help this uh, this open opening process. And so um, at GigaScience, we were using quite um, old, old, uh, old publishing platforms, you know, working with traditional publishers. And we were quite frustrated that this held us back in a number of ways, particularly the speeds, the, the interactivity and the um, and the cost of, of, of publishing. It was still quite expensive. And so um, this made us um, uh, think that maybe uh, maybe we needed to, to launch a second a second Giga Journal, and so that's what we did. Working with a technology provider, River Valley Technologies, um, based in uh, India in the UK, we uh, in twenty at the end of twenty twenty really we launched a new journal called Gigabyte, and what Gigabyte the key thing that has allowed uh, Gigabyte to operate um, differently has been. My slides not changing. Okay, has been that uh, it has a completely new technological platform. Everything is in XML from start to finish. So um, the key th the key things that this uh, allows it uh, firstly having one platform for the whole workflow means there's none of this API spaghetti. Things don't fall through the gaps. That that increases speed and accuracy for starters. But the most important thing is it. Um, automates the production of really beautiful uh, publication quality PDFs. And um, through uh, automating this, it's completely automated other than uh, humans need to just play around with pagination for a few hours. Um, so that cuts out um, working with traditional publishers, you know, this takes us a month. We can now do this in a matter of hours and cut out, you know, almost all of the human labor there. This has a, a huge time and uh, cost saving. Um, and, and you know it's really important to, to speed up the process, and it also allows a lot more interactivity. Um, uh, we can change views, we can um, add interactive content much much more easily. And so um, to give a to, to then just like demo a little example of of how this uh, what this looks like. These are from some of our our papers that you know it's much easier to embed videos or embed maps, for example. Why have a static map when you can just stick um, OpenStreetMap uh, right into your right into your paper? Um, imaging files. Um, we can basically have pop ups for three D models. You can really kind of scrutinize the scrutinize the data. Um, if it's something you're interested in, um, you know, if it looks uh, of interest data, then um, clicking a button, you can, for example, just view it on a on a virtual reality headset. Um, you, uh, if this is really the data you're interested in, um, you can click on the link in GigaDB and download these 3D files and send them to a 3D printer, for example. Um, Going beyond the data to to software, um, we've got examples where we uh, basically you can click uh, links on um, links on on software papers, and when you see uh, figures, um, you can um, actually scrutinize the code underlying the individual figures in the paper. You can edit these, um, tweak it, and then actually regenerate the paper. Um, for whole software applications, um, we uh, we can embed uh, Code Ocean widgets, and for for wet lab methods, for non computational methods, um, we can embed uh, and and allow pop ups to um, protocols.io uh, much more easy to use stepwise protocols. Um, so as uh, as everything is in XML, this allows you to really rethink what a paper looks like uh, and how you view it. So. Um, you can click a button and actually uh, change the language, for example, of, of, of the paper. Um, you can click a button and change the font. This is for uh, this is a dyslexic font. You can change fundamentally the views, right? The way that the, the style, the view of your paper, you can set up new views to to view this. This is the this is the eLife um, lens view for, of, of, of the paper, for example. And um, yeah, it really goes beyond the, the PDF to, to this, um, to, to much more interactive um, uh, articles. 
Um, from the from the from a practical side, we've made this. We've focused only on publishing data and software. So we've tried to also make the the review process easier. We've got um, questionnaire based reviews. We want research to be much uh, shared much more quickly. So we um, basically uh, link preprints with the actual publications. We've got um, uh, a few page a few. Um, third party sites also hosting all of the peer reviews because we do this transparently and um and uh, so, 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 so the fundamentals of a, of a data data re release paper here um we really set simplify the simplify the structure um just focus on the discoverability and credit um and it's about the data and not analysis. Um, you know, it, you, we can coordinate it with a, with an analysis paper, for, for for example. And yet, this simple structure, we just want the context, the methods, the a little bit on validation and QC um, comments on the reuse potential, and then the then the availability. And um, so, um, talking of 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 uh, of data papers um, of this process, you know, we've got this workflow now. And um, we've really wanted to, uh, pr you know, promote this. We think we can do things faster and cheaper and more easily than 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 other platforms and, and journals. And so um, we uh, actually uh, pitched and bid to uh, a, um, a GBIF uh, special series um, specifically on. Uh, uh, data sets on vectors of human disease. And um, this was in conjunction with, with TDR and was funded by the WHO. So they put money on the on the table to, you know, remove the remove the cost barrier and sponsor um, and, and promote it to the to their many of their user groups that, you know, we have all of these data gaps. Uh, a data papers are a good way that you can get credit, and and we you know we'll be doing everything we can to make this process as easy as possible. So the deadline was the end of next month, uh, last month. So unfortunately, um, yeah, we, uh, if anyone was interested in submitting, you're you're too late to for this series. But um, but we've got this system set up now, and we're very very happy to take um, to take data pa papers in this area. So um, of the uh, submissions that we that we received, um, this is uh, so they're all under peer review at the moment. Um, but we've seen over six hundred thousand observations added to the GBIF database. Right, it's it's added. Um, it's great to see that it has incentivized uh, you know a big a big effort to to release really really useful uh, vector information data. The geographic spread of these, we received lots of submissions from South America, from Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, um, also papers from individual European countries and also the uh, big European consortia, uh, a, a big North American, um, pan North American study. The taxonomic coverage, um, a lot of mosquito papers, a bunch of sand fly uh, vectors, and also um, uh, one you know papers on um, uh, kissing bugs and uh, ticks, and um, mostly you know papers on uh, just describing a big bunch of observations from a collection. But we've seen a, a really interesting range that I was not expecting. Um, examples of citizen collected data, big uh, pan European and, and US surveys, you know, a big uh, uh, consortia studies. Um, longitudinal data studies, um, or, you know, also collecting, um, digitizing collections going back over a century, um, and uh, examples where, um, in in particular regions where uh, non-professional scientists actually curated, uh, you know, kind of paper literature and and digitized uh, over fifty years of of examples, um, and it's great we've managed to incentivize. Um, what is a you know a lot of work to 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 write and digitize all of this up? Now the brilliant thing because we're an open science journal, you know this is all under peer review. Um, but and normally I wouldn't be able to kind of talk about this stuff. But uh, because most of our author, all of the data has already been shared in GBIF, 
and most of the papers have preprints. So we can actually start to, I can give you a few examples of some of these. You can even look at the preprints now. And um, really interesting to see uh, some of them, you know, giving lots of context on the sampling methods, um, really lovely examples where they've um, worked with indigenous communities in the, in the Amazon. Um, and, you know, because a lot of this work was done in South America, um, the, the, the preprints were shared with uh, Cielo preprints. So there are even um, uh, Spanish and Portuguese language versions of this to really kind of boost the discoverability and, and understanding by, by researchers in, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in South America. And, um, um, you know, we've got uh, European examples, uh, this one, for example, the the object, the the uh, mosquito vectors of disease um, project in in the Benelux countries. They the the objectives were to uh, inventory endemic and invading mosquito species. Um, they've done a, a longitudinal work for about fifteen years and and have then digitized collections going back one hundred and eleven years. Um, they really want this to assess population dynamics and model the biodiversity of these vectors at a one kilometer resolution across all of the Benelux countries. And they, you know, they, one of their key objectives, the, you know, their final key objective was to di disseminate the outputs to the scientific community, end users and the public. And this is what they've done by submitting to the series. Um, uh this is you know this is the whole point of a data paper is that this is the this is the disseminate this is the whole dissemination um process so we basically helped them meet um meet that objective um so it was really nice to see uh um from having worked with mosquito alert as a citizen to actually see their their um next batch of data actually be submitted to our series and um this is a, uh, um, they've now collected data from um, 2014 to 2021 uh, across Europe, uh, coming from Spain heavily from there, but from many, many other European countries now. Um, all of their data was, um, it, it's through, through, through photographs and the, and the GIS and the, and the um, geographic data um, validated by uh, entomologist experts that they've been working with. And so um, this, this example, which you can see in preprint form, that it has um, over 30,000 observations in GBIF. But the amazing thing is it also has the 40,000 imaging files uh, publicly available in the EBI bioimaging archive that, you know, if you're doing AI research, um, you know, image, image analysis, those kinds of machine learning uh, techniques, that, that's a huge uh, resource there. And, and finally, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, we got unsolicited feedback from the authors of this, of this uh, amazing study, um, talking about, um, talking about this saying that they, that the whole process of writing the, and submitting the paper to us, they want to say that the whole process of putting this data set together was cathartic. Um, it, the process meant that they had to make many decisions on how to put together in, in this kind of organic, chaotic way, with many, many actors involved, um, many different types of contributions from experts, from citizens um, um, and the like, knowing that they needed to give credit to everyone um, and how to do this in a, in a fair way. Um, and just a simple way of that they, that they had to write this all up in a paper, gave them the possibility to explain all of this history, all of these contributions, um, uh, amongst the, the Mosquito Alert core team and all of the expert validation community, which goes way beyond the data set itself. So um, they've, in the, finally, they want to say it's important to tell us that there's going to be a before and after this publication uh, by the Mosquito Alert team. They're designing a strategy for the database and scientific paper co-authorship going forward. Um, but this has really put it on the agenda now. Um, so this was, this was just... Um, Really, really nice to see that um, you know we've pro provided a, a means and a, and a system to, to to really help them rethink how they do fundamentally they do their project and, and and take it forward and credit everybody. So this was this was super super nice to see, um, and um, yeah. So you know, just like to to end uh, by saying that um, 
you know, Gigabyte is, is here. Um, we hope this kind of demonstrates a new way of, of publishing FAIR research using this new technology um, to, to help tackle a lot of these urgent world problems um, and rethink a lot of the publication process. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, the new journal allowed us to, to basically set up our new publishing house. Um, if people have uh, journals that they're thinking of launching, they can come to us. Have a big team of people to thank um, uh, at, at uh, GigaScience, our, our host organization of VGI and River Valley Technologies, our um, technology partner. Um, contact us, um, follow us on social media, ask us questions if you have um, uh, uh, data, similar data that you're, you're interested in, uh, in, 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 in submitting in this way. And hopefully there's some time now for questions um, on all of this. And I hopefully by talking about uh, data sharing as well, this will help set up the data, um, the, 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 the panel this afternoon as well, um, covering a lot of these topics. So I will um, stop my slides, stop the uh, sharing and um, see if there are questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Edmunds, for your enlightened presentation. Uh, we have a question in the chat box. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting to see. Okay, so the question I was asking, I'm curious to know what are your um, uh, hypothesis regarding very few data observations submitted to GBA from Asia? And yes, that was a, that was a bit disappointing. Um, we were hoping. Um, it would span all of the world. Like obviously, um, all, doing all of the Americas was 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 really satisfying. But yeah, we didn't have anything from um, submitted yet from Asia and Africa, um, which are very important uh, areas for for a lot of these vectors. Um, so we had quite a fast turnaround. It was it wasn't easy. The deadlines that we were given by the by the by the funders were, were was only a few months. So we were a bit worried that. Um, and that may have uh, stopped. Uh, that might, you know, limited um, uh, some of the some of the submissions that people just didn't have time to write it up. You know, we can take picture papers um, retrospectively from this. They won't be eligible for the funding in this manner. But in, um, our, our APCs, our article processing charges, are very very cheap, three hundred and fifty US dollars. And we can also offer waivers to to uh, many of these places if they don't have funds. Um, we've heard um, informally that there was a bunch of submissions from Southeast Asia that um, that they've been writing up, but have unfortunately missed the deadline. So we're, we're uh, fingers crossed. Um, we will get we 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 heard we we should get some from Southeast Asia. Um, we did a webinar with GBIF. Um, back in January and the 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 turnout the um, 100 people registered for that and. The participation was really interesting. There was a lot from um, Sudan, from um, uh, we we saw some from Pakistan, and and uh, like a lot of country, a lot of um, a lot of countries that we're really hoping to get submissions from. Like it, it's definitely of interest in 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 Asia and 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 in Africa, but for 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 whatever reason they didn't quite meet the deadline. But I'm I'm really hopeful that um, we will get. Um, submissions from them because it because it's it's a it's a great opportunity to, um, to 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 get credit for a lot of these you know a lot of the 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 these um the people who are credited on these types of papers are, are the often don't make it onto you know if they're if a lot of these entomologists people working in the field the the, the uh, uh, one of the main a lot of the rationale for for data papers are is it credits the data producers who may not get credited at all, or if they are cred credited in a big consortium paper, they're just like lost in the middle of the paper somewhere, right? They, 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 um, a lot of these people don't get the credit they deserve. So it's, an, it's a great opportunity to, get, to give these, um, to give these, these people, um, give these people the, the credit that they do really deserve, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, um, do we have any more questions? I don't see any questions in the chat box. 
Anyhow, if you have any additional question, you can also um, feel free to submit it uh, to our uh, or to send it by email in our email address. We'll provide it later. Um, I hope okay. I set. I hope I help set the scene for the data panel as well, right? We, people can kind of, if you think of, if people think of things over lunch, they can kind of um, sure bring that to the panel discussion as well. Yeah, sure. So uh, we have a, a question now in the chat box. Uh, given limitations of uh, limitation of references by a journal, how to seed uh, all uh, DOI? So that that is an interesting question. So. Um, it depends on the article type and depends on the journal. So some 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 journals do have citation limits, for example. Um, hope you know. Hopefully, it's better practice not not to have these. And if you can cite everything, then then you know, please please cite everything. Um, uh, good journals will specifically have a data availability section that will um, that will. Um, Hopefully, hopefully cite it, but, but often in, in some journals, the data availability section, at least it's the place that you list that if you don't cite if you don't cite it in the references, at, at least you can put the list the DOI details in that data availability section. Um, for examples where you have many, 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 uh, if you're if you're doing a big study with um, huge numbers of data sets all together and they all have they all have DOIs, for example. Um, there are ways of collecting together lots and lots of DOIs um, and then having a kind of uh, linking them, having a top level DOI beyond all of this. That So there's a big, you know, a big data collection will only have one DOI. So that will save you a lot of space um, in, in our GigaDB, for example. You know, we had one project that had a, a, over a thousand DOIs, but we couldn't put a thousand DOIs in the paper. We had a, a top level DOI crediting all of the projects linked to all of the thousand DOIs under it. And that was the, that one DOI was the one they cited in the paper. Uh, some data repositories like Bold, Barcode, Barcode of Life, you can collect together lots and lots of data sets and they give you one DOI for data set collection, for example. So that, that, that would be, if you do have, um, if you are given uh, citation limits by the journal, there, there are ways to, to collect stuff together. Um, but yeah, if you're stuck, you're, you're, you're stuck, you can, it's not as good, but as if, you, you know, um, if you can just put the DOI in the, in the text, that's better, better than nothing as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments also. Um, Okay, if there are no more questions, then I would like to thank you again, Dr. Edmunds, for joining us for your presentation and for answering the questions. It was indeed very informative and uh, interesting presentation.